Good morning. It is my uh, great privilege this morning to uh, bring to you a message from today's text that was beautifully read to us uh, by the Ham family and uh, a special shout out to Oliver that was very well read. Um, I'm preaching to you from the comfort of my study and I, am, I hope that uh, you're comfortable where you are as well, but not too comfortable that you can't hear uh, the voice of the Holy Spirit as he prompts us um, during the message. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. And as we think on these things, will you open our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say to us? Will you um, speak to our hearts this morning through your word? In your great name we pray. Amen. Now, it is in times of crisis that we look to a figure, a leader, someone who we can trust and believe to guide us through the darkness and out the other side. And that person might be a political leader or a community leader. But I think you would have noticed recently how we have developed a serious trust deficit in our world. Many people these days question our institutions. Uh, for the lack of organisation and coordination. They question our leaders for lack of transparency and lack of vision. We even distrust our scientists and technocrats for their lack of consensus. But as believers, we can turn to God because ultimately his track record is perfect. And we know that he is for us and that we can trust his faithfulness we can believe in his gospel of grace. We can rely on the forgiveness that we have through Christ. And we have the hope of eternal life. So we can believe in our savior. The question is, how much do we trust him as Lord? If we were to honestly examine our lives, when the going gets tough, do we wait on God expectantly? Do we tend to take matters into our own hands? Or do we become consumed by anxiety and fret? If you see an opportunity to skirt the rules and gain advantage over somebody else, do you instead let God's will take its course? Or do you take the advantage? And how much are you willing to go it alone if necessary and forego some things in order to pursue God's will? And when we hear what we say to each other behind closed doors, when we're alone with our own thoughts, when nobody else knows, can we see clear evidence of our trust? You know, if we're honest with each other, ourselves, we can perhaps find it easier to believe in a saviour than we find it to trust in him as Lord. And yet the two things are indispensably linked. It is interesting that the original Greek words for faith, trust and belief all come from the same word. Charles Spurgeon in his book, All of Grace, describes faith as being made up of three things, knowledge, belief, and hope. Knowledge comes first, and then the mind believes, and then our hearts trust him. It affects the, the decisions we make. We commit ourselves to our merciful God, rest our hope on his gospel, trust our souls on a dying savior whose atoning blood washes away our sins. Then we accept his perfect righteousness and receive the Holy Spirit. And from that moment, our trust begins to grow as we grow in our knowledge of him who gave everything for us. So this belief and trust is not blind because it makes sense to our minds, but it doesn't just stop at the intellectual acceptance of truth. Remember, even demons believe there is a God, but they tremble and 
here as a result because they believe, but they don't trust it. Faith is believing in a saviour. Now, let me be quite clear here in case you've heard me wrong. We are saved by grace alone. Obedience to Christ, submitting to his will, trusting in his promises, none of these things are prerequisites for our salvation. But genuine belief naturally leads to a life marked by trusting God. We start with belief, but then we grow in trust. So if believing in God is so beneficial, why is it that people so struggle so much to come to faith in the first place. And if living a life of trust is part of believing, why do we have so much trouble trusting God in all areas of our lives? Well, can I suggest that in today's text from John chapter seven, we can find some answers to these questions. John does this by having us look at unbelief. What we see today um, in the text is a bunch of people who are having trouble believing in Jesus, believing that he is the son of God. And through looking at these people, we can see the root causes of unbelief. And when we can see these root causes, we can also identify the same barriers that exist in our lives that hinder us, that put a break on our trust in Jesus. You may remember from last week's uh, passage in John chapter six, that Jesus followers were finding his teaching a bit hard going, a bit difficult to accept. And in verse 66 of chapter six, it says that many of his disciples turned back, no longer willing to follow him. And for me, that is one of the saddest, most crushing verses in the New Testament. turn back, no longer willing to follow him. So we come to chapter seven and in verse one, it says after this, because it is now about six months since the events of chapter six. And it says that during this time, Jesus is aware that the religious leaders in Judea are plotting against him. And so he spends the majority of his ministry in Galilee. Now you see, to know that for a Jew living in Judea, which is in the south and has the capital Jerusalem, they kind of look down on the northern rural backwater of Galilee. But no one thought that anybody from Galilee was culturally segregated, was racially pure, and nobody thought that someone from Galilee could be religiously observant. Even the way the Galileans talked was a butt of Judean humour. So making claims of being the promised Jewish Messiah and hanging out in rural, unimportant Galilee is a kind of publicity disaster as far as Jesus' brothers were concerned. And so they give Jesus some free advice, but it's not spiritual advice. Made themselves Jesus' self appointed political advisors. And if you read there in the text in verse 4, his brothers tell him to leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. What they're saying to him is Jesus, if you want to be a success, you need to impress the people that really matter. And they're not in Galilee, they're in the big smoke in Jerusalem. That's where you need to be to show off your powers. This is your chance to build popularity, to build a power base, to create an image for yourself. That's why they say to him, no one who wants to be a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. Now the festival of tabernacles or booths, 
is approaching. And it is one of the three main pilgrimage festivals of the Jewish faith. They still celebrate it today, commemorating 40 years of desert wanderings after the exodus from Egypt, all those years ago. Everybody's sleeping in tents during that period of time. And so throughout the city of Jerusalem and the countryside for eight days, people built these little shacks or lean-tos with tree branches. Um, and they'd be everywhere on, the, on the, in the rooftops, in the streets. It's a real fun time, especially for kids, maybe not so much for parents. The city will be packed with people. And this, to the brothers, was an ideal opportunity for them to take up, for, uh, for them to sit up and take notice of Jesus. Now, we know a few things about Jesus' brothers or half brothers. There are four of them, according to the Gospel of Matthew. The most well known is James, who would later become a believer and actually became the head of the church in Jerusalem. And he became, he was also the author of the book of James. A lesser known brother was Judas, not Iscariot, but he too became a believer later on and wrote the book of Jude. It must have been hard though to grow up as Jesus' half brothers. Some of you may have siblings um, who, you know, played up, got into trouble growing up. But in the eyes of mum and dad, they could do no wrong. Well, Jesus did no wrong, ever. It must have been unsufferable growing up with him. Now, we can't be completely sure what their motive was to tell Jesus to go up to Jerusalem. But actually, there's no indication here that they were trying to take revenge on him or deliberately goad him into a dangerous situation. Instead, what the text suggests is that they were frustrated by his lack of success. And they genuinely wanted him to get back on track. Perhaps they were hoping to benefit in some way from the reflected glory of Jesus. You know, he's a revolutionary who commands a huge rebel army. Well, he's our brother. But then we get to verse five. John departs from the narrative, almost in parentheses, makes a little side comment. And that is a bit of a shock. Because in verse 5 it says, For even his brothers did not believe him. For even his brothers did not believe him. Now this comment is disturbing for two reasons. Firstly, they were Jesus' half-brothers. They grew up with him. They saw him close up, broke bread with him, traveled with him. They were familiar with his incredible character, his passion and his integrity. But they did not believe him. Prominent theologian and author Leon Morris said that leaders who were under pressure were often able to retreat to the comfort and support of family. Our Lord Jesus didn't even have that. But there's another reason what that makes this shocking, that they didn't believe him. They witnessed his miracles, his power, and they clearly believed in his ability to do them. They loved them. They were amazed just like everybody else. And yet in verse 5, it says they did not believe him. I mean, if his brother said to him, I've seen what you do. It's all trickery and sleight of hand. You're a charlatan, Jesus. You're an embarrassment to the family. We don't believe you. If they'd said that, it would actually be more understandable. But no, they loved his miracles. They believed in his power. And yet, they didn't really know what he was about. So it is possible to believe in the work of Jesus. But in the end, to not believe his deity as God. It is possible to want the benefit of Jesus, but actually not believe in him or trust him with your life. How could that be? Well, 
we see that Jesus' brothers are buying into the worldview that in order to be a success, you have to create a good image of yourself. You have to gain the approval of people. You need to be in the limelight. You need to be significant in the eyes of man, to be influential, to be the funniest person, the most likable person. The world is impatient for recognition for the limelight. On the other hand, it is very sensitive to others' disapproval. It's been passed over with the world. And we can find ourselves easily buying into this as well. Your glory, your image, your reputation is the most important thing. You could find yourself in a place of unbelief. Or you could find it hard to trust. Because there's much about following Jesus that will tarnish your image in the eyes of the world. Because there's much to give up and sacrifice in following Jesus. And one of them is the approval of man. But if we look into the heart of Christ, we see that he has no interest in succumbing to the temptation of self glory. We've already seen that in his temptation at the beginning of his ministry. How does Jesus answer his brothers? Look down at your text in verse 6. Jesus says, My time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The word for time here is kairos, meaning moment. What Jesus is saying is he operates according to his father's script his father's timetable. The moment that God, my father, has for me has not come. For me, says Jesus, I make decisions and my life revolves totally around what the father wants me to do, where he wants me to go, how he wants me to go. I live and breathe only in accordance with what my father has planned for me. I'm not interested in man's glory. My life is not man exalting. My life is God exalting. In verse seven, Jesus goes on and says, the world can't hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. Why? Because it's you brothers, are driven by the same things the world lives for. That's why the world can't hate you. You say that this life is all there is, and so it makes sense to pursue reputation and fame. But I tell you, when you seek your own glory and not God's glory, that's evil. And when I say that, that's offensive for the world. You know, if Jesus was alive today, they would call, call him a hater. That's what the Bible makes clear. Jesus is a hater. Because he exposes and calls out our evil, our selfishness, our self-seeking, our relentless pursuit of self. So we can see the difference. His brothers love the praise of men. And Jesus rejects that because he's pursuing his father's glory. That's why his brothers cannot believe in him or trust him. And in verse 10, Jesus turns his brother's advice to sit on his head. He's not lying or deceiving them. He's saying, I'm not going up to Jerusalem in the way you want. So after his brothers leave for the festival, he goes also, not publicly, but in secret in such a way as to avoid the attention of men, but in accordance with his father's will. When he gets to Jerusalem, he then discovers that there is another kind of unbelief. And in many ways, this is a, a more familiar form of unbelief that we commonly see today. Unlike Jesus' brothers, Many of the Jewish leaders and their followers 
are not excited by Jesus' miracles. They are threatened by them. They want him killed. Their belief is marked by contempt and hostility. And Jesus is well aware of this hostility, which is the reason he stayed in Galilee to minister. In verse 21, we read that the miracle that sets off this tidal wave of hostility is the healing of the paralyzed man back in chapter five. As it turns out, it isn't the healing per se, but the day he performs the healing that has become the law. According to Jewish law, you cannot work on, sab- on the Sabbath. And the poor guy who was healed was caught carrying his mat after his classified as a law. Of course, the healing itself as well. Verse 20, 22 to 23, Jesus points this out. Under the law, a Jewish boy is circumcised on the eighth day of his life. Of course, you can't control when a child is born. So if the eighth day happens to fall on the Sabbath, you can't delay the ritual. And so they allowed this uh, to go ahead as a special dispensation or an exemption, even though theoretically work is not allowed on the Sabbath. But what Jesus is saying, you can make an exception of circumcision, but as soon as I perform a healing that makes a man whole again, which is an act of compassion. Somehow I've broken some unbreakable law. The truth is they are threatened by his miracles. They knew that it gave his claim to be the son of God credence. And that opposed the problem for them because that would make him a threat to their power base. My guess is that some of the leaders didn't really care too much for the Jewish law at all. You see, they had this racket, the arrangement, and they were keen to preserve it. And to preserve it, they needed to maintain the effect of the Jewish leadership. And they were worried they might lose their following to Jesus. So their credibility was under threat also because he was exposing the hypocrisy. No doubt there were other devout religious leaders who did care about the law. But Jesus was also showing that their law keeping was not out of love. It was out of pride and self-glorification. To them, Jesus was just a lawbreaker, a violator of the Sabbath. They could see that he was the Messiah because they they couldn't see that he was the Messiah because of their self-righteousness which blinded them to his true identity. And the truth is that they are blind to their diagnosis and not willing to accept God's grace. So you can see that the common factor root unbelief in all of these people, Jesus' half brothers, the crowd, and the Jewish leaders. And the common denominator is this, the pursuit human approval and the glory of man leads to unbelief and it also causes us to be distracted. How does that contrast with Jesus' attitude? Well, halfway through the festival, Jesus comes out into the public. But it's not to perform miracles but to teach at the temple. It was typical in those days for rabbis to hang out under the porticles of the temple and the people to gather around and listen to them teach. And that's what Jesus was doing. The Jews were astonished at his teaching. Notice, though, it's not what he was teaching that that astonished them, but his intellect and oratory. What they thought was, considering he did not attend one of the dozens of yeshivas or rabbinic colleges around Jerusalem, how could he have learnt um, this amount of scholarly material? 
It's a kind of a backhanded compliment, I guess. They should have been listening to what he was teaching because Jesus immediately deflects attention back to the crowd. In verse 16, it says, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the, from the one who sent me. And in verse 18, whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is, it is there is nothing false about him. So this uncovers the truth that belief and trust in God only come when we give up our pursuit of self-glory and human. It's not easy, is it? Because we find ourselves in a merit-based system, in a meritocracy, where, the, where effort leads to reward. From the time we are born, we are judged according to our effort. You think about it. You need to get an ATAR to get into a university course. When you go for a job interview, you need to pro promote yourself to show that you, you um, satisfy the requirements for get, getting this particular job. When you seek a promotion at work, again, you need to prove yourself in order to get the position. And socially, people judge you and reward you for, with compliments based on how you look, what your house looks like, where you've traveled to, what you've achieved. And even sometimes amongst Christians, we can also judge each other based on these things. You know that saying where it says, God helps those who helps themselves? I just want to say that does not apply. Whatever that apl applies to, it doesn't apply to God's grace. Because God helps those who can't help themselves. And it is those who realize that they can't help themselves that they go to God for his grace. And those who think they can help themselves well, they don't go to God at all. So maybe you've been trying to climb that ladder. This morning, God is asking you to get off the ladder. Get off the merry-go-round of seeking human praise and self-glory. Or maybe your dreams and aspirations have been crueled. is telling you to stop striving because you are greatly loved and through his grace he's adopted you to be his son and daughter and that's what God wants you to know growing trust in God can only come when we are able to wean ourselves off the eye we are willing to give up the fruitless reliance on human approval and approval. In closing, I just want to go back to the statement Jesus makes repeatedly that his time was not yet. Well, his time did come. Jesus' brothers tell him to go down to Jerusalem to make a name. When he gets there, the Jewish crowds wanted him out of there because they were threatening, and he was threatening their position. Neither realized he would eventually go to Jerusalem, in spite of the opposition and quite apart from the encouragement of the crowds. So we ride into Jerusalem to the palm branch of the Zebrian crowd. And in the darkness of Gethsemane, he will submit to the pain. Then, in the full glare of the screaming crowd, he will be called and known as Jesus. 
in the gloom of a darkening sky. And there will be the demonstration of God's power. But not the way the brothers expected. When the Son of God gives himself up to die. That is a demonstration. And that is the only glory we should be seeking. Humility and gratitude. Imagine what our church would be like if we were transformed by this truth. If instead of pursuing glory and significance for ourselves and, and expending energy doing that, instead of being fearful of losing the praise of God, looking to fix our eyes on the one whose glory we mark. Glory is on that cross that stands in the way and gives that firm hope that our future is secure. What radical lives we would lead, what worldliness we would willingly let go, what impact we would have though to on those around us and the power of the spirit. It is a work in progress. It is a work of the Holy Spirit in us but it also depends on our will. We can believe in a saviour and we can trust him as Lord. Let us pray. Father God, we acknowledge our weakness, that in many ways we are wired to need and require human acknowledgement and praise. But you are calling us, Father, to trust you. You are calling us to your grace, to your total acceptance through the work of Christ on the cross. Help us not to be shaped by society's expectation or succumb to the allure of human praise. But remind us constantly of the sufficiency of your grace Help us to encourage each other with this truth. In your great name we pray. Amen.